On a cold January evening in 1942, a German U-boat surfaced in New York City's lower bay undetected. As her commander, Captain Lieutenant Reinhard Hardigan, stood on the bridge, the bright skyline of Manhattan lay before him. To Hardigan's astonishment, though the U.S. had been at war for over a month, the East Coast sparkled, undimmed, from New York to Miami. It was as if America was untouched by the global conflict. But this was about to change. U-123 was only one of five submarines that were about to unleash Operation Drumbeat, an unprecedented campaign to defeat the underprepared United States on its own shores. The result was a period of terror all along the length of the East Coast, where German U-boats waded offshore to assault merchant ships, easily spotted thanks to city lights. And the terror was only beginning. By spring, these predators would be stalking the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. For months, U.S. Navy commanders were well aware of the possibility that U-boats might attack American coastal waters. Yet they stood by and allowed Operation Drumbeat, the second happy time of the Kriegsmarine, to become a dark chapter in American naval history that should have been averted. The first couple of years of World War II were a period of severe frustration for Kriegsmarine Admiral Carl Dönitz. As the architect of the Third Reich's U-boat fleet, he had only 46 operational submarines at his disposal when war with Great Britain broke out in September 1939. Despite this initial scarcity, endless mechanical issues, and unreliable torpedoes, Dönitz, a hands-on leader who maintained close communication with his U-boat commanders, led his men to surprising early success. From July through October 1940, in a period German submariners called the Happy Time, Dönitz's crews sank 282 ships, totaling 1.48 million gross tons of invaluable British shipping. Following France's fall, the Germans had secured five critical seaports on the French Atlantic coast, providing them direct access to the North Atlantic Ocean. Soon, a new adversary appeared on the horizon, the U.S. Navy. In the fall of 1941, American President Franklin D. Roosevelt authorized a significant escalation in vessel support in the Atlantic Ocean for beleaguered Great Britain. As a result, an incensed Dernitz, who saw the U.S.'s actions as blatant breaches of international law, urged the Fuhrer to greenlight an attack on the fleet. However, Hitler, in hopes of keeping America out of the war, declined. Even with these limitations, an undeclared naval war erupted. On September 4th, after an encounter between a German U-boat and the destroyer USS Greer, President Roosevelt issued a shoot-on-sight order. Finally, on December 9th, 1941, Grand Admiral Eric Rader, the commander of the Kriegsmarine, lifted all restrictions on German naval attacks against American vessels by his surface and submarine fleets, including waters along the U.S. east coast. This happened only two days after the infamous Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. By New Year's Day 1942, under the stern leadership of Admiral Dernitz, the U-boat force had evolved into a feared and battle-hardened naval unit, boasting 248 submarines and more than 5 million tons of sunk shipping. Still, this wasn't enough for the Admiral. Aiming to exploit American unpreparedness fully, he believed that in addition to disrupting Atlantic shipping lanes, Sinking U.S. supply ships near their own shores would inflict even greater demoralization. Thus, Dönitz began planning his first wave of attacks in United States coastal waters in what he called Operation Drumbeat. Hoping to deploy many long-range boats, Dönitz requested 12 models from the High Command for the operation. He secured only six Type 9 models and 12 smaller Type 7 ones. Nevertheless, he successfully assembled a small but potent fleet for Drumbeat's initial wave, carefully selecting the Type 9 U-boat commanders and providing them with the crucial strategic and tactical directives they would require for this important mission. As Admiral Dernitz prepared to deploy six long-range boats and a dozen smaller ones to North America, another submarine was already hard at work. Since mid-December, U-653 led by Captain Lieutenant Gerhard Feiler, had been operating in the Mid-Atlantic as a radio decoy, with the crew transmitting dozens upon dozens of encrypted messages to give the appearance of a feared U-boat wolf pack. The acts of this decoy were a hopeful attempt at masking the westward moves of the U-boats 
as they quietly left on the month-long Atlantic crossing, heading to America. By early January, Director Roger Wynne from the British Operational Intelligence Center, or OIC, was already well aware of Dernitz's plans to deploy a force of U-boats west across the Atlantic, seeing through the German Admiral's fake Wolfpack messages. Suspecting that the German Admiral was prepping a submarine patrol line in the Western Atlantic, or even worse, advancing to attack along the American coast, London's OIC repeatedly sent the U.S. Navy the top-secret reports listing the known locations and activities of the moving German U-boat force. Across the ocean, the United States Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, was in a chaotic state of disarray. Taken totally by surprise by Pearl Harbor, the Washington, D.C. office was amidst a confusing fog of complex bureaucratic structures and internal feuding. Director of War Plans and the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, Rear Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, saw counterintelligence and espionage with profound contempt and refused to utilize the ONI. Additionally, the commander of the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet, Admiral Ernest J. King, although experienced in submarines with lessons learned in World War I, had a profound hatred of everything British. Therefore, naval leadership ignored London's messages, as well as their own intelligence office. Meanwhile, the U-boat pack was drawing nearer. As ordered by Admiral Dernitz, by January 12th, five Operation Drumbeat U-boats reached their assigned patrol area. A sixth submarine, U-502, aborted her patrol following an oil leak. These five vessels were assigned different target areas, like the Outer Banks of North Carolina, miles offshore from Cape Cod, the Virginia Capes, and the Northeast Canadian coast. This particular zone was to be covered alongside the 12 smaller ones. Finally, there was U-123, with the target area spanning the coastline between Atlantic City, New Jersey, and Long Island, New York. As daylight faded into the night on January 12th, after nearly a month of traveling, the 52-person crew of the German U-boat stood at full combat alert and ready for the attack. Aboard this 252-foot-long submarine were a 105mm deck gun and three smaller machine guns, but the primary weapon aboard was 22 torpedoes to sink enemy vessels. For their journey, men were given no maps or charts. Instead, Captain Lieutenant Reinhard Hardigan knew he'd arrived on the coast via two tourist guides to New York City, one of which had a fold-out map of the harbor. Only hours earlier, U-123's lookout sighted smoke on the horizon, and their leader, Hardigan, ordered a course to intercept. As the submarine closed in on the target, they identified it as a 10,000-ton British freighter. The ship was SS Cyclops, a British cargo steamship nearing the final stretch of a nearly 14,000-mile trip from the Far East to the British Isles. At 125 miles southeast of Cape Sable on Nova Scotia's southern tip, disaster struck without warning as the U-boat launched a surface torpedo attack against the cargo vessel, hitting the starboard side, setting off a massive fireball, and sending a column of seawater skyward. After settling her by the stern, she stayed afloat. Still, Cyclops' captain, knowing she was beyond saving, ordered the ship to be abandoned. Right before taking to the lifeboats, he also ensured that the radio officer had sent a distress signal and received an acknowledgement from a shore radio station. Aboard U-123, the submarine's radio man alerted Captain Lieutenant Hardigan that Cyclops was sending out a Morse code message reporting they'd been attacked by a U-boat. With this, and noticing that the cargo ship wasn't sinking, Hardigan ordered the U-boat closer. Then, from a point-blank range of only 650 yards, he struck the British ship with another torpedo, breaking the ship in two. Within four minutes, SS Cyclops had sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and U-123 left the scene without rescuing any survivors. Upon receiving the Morse code message, the Royal Canadian Navy dispatched two minesweepers to the scene. At the same time, the Royal Canadian Air Force sent off an aircraft in a futile search for the U-boat. The U-boat's attack on Cyclops on January 11, 1942, was only the beginning of a series of attacks on Allied merchant shipping in the Western Hemisphere. According to historians, 26 more ships were sunk by the U-boats in a little over a week. These German boats cruised along the coast, safely submerged through the day and surfacing at night, 
to pick off merchant vessels outlined against the lights of the American cities. Once they heard about the sudden and powerful coastal blitzkrieg, reactions across the ocean were strong. The men and women at London's Operations Intelligence Center were fuming, especially since they'd given the Americans more than enough warning. According to intelligence officer Patrick Beasley, quote, With the information available, it seems inconceivable now that the Americans could have been so completely and totally unprepared. But as the submarines from the first wave returned to occupied France in February, Dernitz, the master of U-boat warfare, gleefully delighted in just how unprepared the Americans were. In his log, he wrote that all along the American coast, quote, conditions were almost exactly those of normal peacetime. The coast was not blacked out. The towns were a blaze of bright lights. Soon, he and all his officers would refer to the early months of 1942 as the Kriegsmarine's second happy time. When the U-boats began their rampage against East Coast shipping in mid-January 1942, it became apparent to senior U.S. Navy officials that silence would not work. Too many sinkings were visible from American shores. As a result, on Friday, January 23rd, a Navy spokesman issued a statement to reporters, quote, There are many rumors and unofficial reports about the capture or destruction of enemy submarines. Some of the recent visitors to our territorial waters will never enjoy the return portion of their voyage. Further, the percentage of one-way traffic is increasing, while that of two-way traffic is satisfactorily on the decline. But this was far from the truth. In fact, the first successful sinking of a German U-boat didn't occur until April 14, 1942. By then, the submarines had sunk over 48 ships, and they were moving slowly farther south. While the responsibility rested with Admiral King, he was still preoccupied with the Japanese onslaught in the Pacific. In addition, following Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt set up a severe censorship policy. Publishing any information regarding the movements of any service branch was strictly forbidden, unless released by government officials. The program was designed to shield critical military intel as the armed forces quickly braced for what they correctly predicted to be a long and grueling conflict. However, this ban also served as a convenient smokescreen for the U.S. Navy, masking its glaring unpreparedness for the sudden rising U-boat movements, allowing them to manipulate public perception despite the harsh realities. Because of this, confusion and uncertainty amped up the chaos in the war at sea. The carnage would continue nearly every day for months. Meanwhile, the second wave of Type 9 boats had arrived in North American waters, and the third, Operation Neuland, had also reached its patrol area off the Caribbean oil ports. With so many Allied ships to choose from, and all long-range U-boats already committed to the fight, Dönitz began sending more shorter-range Type 7s to the U.S. East Coast. To save space inside the already small ship, some even filled the freshwater tanks with diesel oil, and the U-boats crossed the Atlantic at very low speed and on a single engine to conserve fuel. As months passed by and targets became harder to find or attack, the ships passed from the U.S. coast into the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, and late in the summer off the South American coast. From a high of six large U-boats patrolling the Gulf on July 16th, the number of boats operating declined to just one or two for the rest of the season. But the U-boat war itself wasn't over when Admiral Carl Dönitz and his staff concluded that the growing risks rendered the attacks no longer cost-effective. It simply moved on to other maritime theaters. After 17 weeks of carnage at sea, in what some later called America's second Pearl Harbor, the 1942 U-boat offensive in the Gulf finally ended on September 5th. During this period, when the Kriegsmarine wolf packs were allowed to rampage virtually unchecked, nearly 400 ships were lost. From then on, the U.S. Navy and Army Air Forces had no choice but to climb a very steep learning curve as they learned effective anti-submarine warfare tactics with painstakingly slow progress. Even 80 years later, many historians wonder why Fleet Commander-in-Chief Admiral Ernest J. King failed to respond to the clearly known threat of the incoming U-boats. In the end, Admiral King kept to his philosophy, quote, Don't tell them anything. When it's over, tell them who won. <laughs> 